Good morning, field biology. Today we will talk mm -hmm. through the herbivore animals from our mammal identification slideshow. Uh, herbivores are plant eaters, and many of these are much bigger than your carnivore uh, counterparts. Another feature that you'll notice is bony things growing out of their heads. So let's take a look here and see what we've got. All right, uh, your first one here, number 43, was the bighorn sheep. And we actually have two pictures of the bighorn sheep. Or actually, three, I believe. Take a look here. So 44 is also a bighorn sheep, and as is 45. So let's take a look at how to identify those. Uh, bighorn sheep are identified, first of all, because of their big horn. Okay, um, clever, right? So... We've got this uh, horn that grows out of their head and curves and curves around here. That's one indicator. Um, color wise, a brown color. They do have a white muzzle. They have a white uh, rump with a black tail tucked in. Um, and that's about the extent of their identifiers. Okay. If we go to this photo, this shows uh, bighorn sheep that are a little younger. So one thing we'll learn when we get into skulls is antlers and horns and how they differ. And uh, you'll learn that horns actually stay on the animal's head for their entire lifespan. So you can tell a little bit about their age by the size of those horns. Here we see a uh, picture of the rams, which are the male bighorn sheep, fighting, um, butting heads, actually more than butting, ramming heads. This is what they do during their breeding period to secure uh, females for, for mating purposes. We do have these in North Dakota. Not a lot of them, but we do have some. Um, probably something we can further look at in... Uh, a future day, a future lesson. Number 46, this is the doll sheep. Uh, initially, you might have looked at this and thought it was a, a white phase bighorn sheep based on our carnivores, uh, but the, nope, it is a separate type of sheep altogether called the doll sheep. These live up in Alaska and in some parts of northwestern Canada. Um, very high elevation sheep, hence the white color, helps it blend into the uh, snowy mountain tops in which it lives. And these two are also doll sheep, uh, females, and a baby. And so we can see the females here also have horns, not quite as big as the male, but body is pure white. Number 48. Number 48 is the mountain goat. These are also pure white. Sometimes people can uh, misidentify the mountain goat and the doll sheep. It's easy to get them confused. Here's another picture of some mountain goats. Mountain goats live in uh, the very western edge, um, kind of the coastline areas, the high elevation uh, west coast areas of Canada, and they do uh, find their way into some of the states like Montana and Idaho and stuff. How to tell the difference between a doll sheep and a big or and a mountain goat? So take a look at the horns. Um, the doll sheep horns they come out and they kind of curve down and to the side and, and wrap around to the front a little bit, just as in the bighorn sheep, where in mountain goats. They're more of a vertical, vertical horn that sweeps backwards. And mountain goats tend to also be a little more boxy. So their face is kind of squared off. Uh, their body's very, very boxy. Legs are shorter in proportion. Those are some clues. All right, number 50. Number 50, we have the white-tailed deer, which 
is an animal that does live uh, in our area. So if you've seen deer around in your lifetime or uh, recently, it's probably been white-tailed deer. The name is, of course, given to the underside of the tail, which is very white. And they, uh, they put that up as a, it's called flagging. They do that to help warn each other of danger, um, keep each other safe, communication tactic. Deer have great eyesight, so it works really well for them. Here's also some white-tailed deer. This would be a, a female and uh, two babies, which we call fawns. Uh, mother deer are called does. Male deer are called bucks. Uh, a couple of ways to tell this deer from the next deer. The antler is very... A unique and white-tailed deer. It has a, a main beam with tines coming off separately. Uh, the face is a brown color and we already mentioned the tail. Here's a white-tailed fawn. Uh, white-tailed fawns are born with uh, spots and these spots are an adaptation for their survival in uh, um, in the springtime when the sun shines through the trees and we get broken up light patterns on the uh, on the ground and the dots or spots help them to blend in with such a such a lighting because they aren't real fast but they can stand still when they're little. All right, the other deer that we have here is the mule deer, okay? If you know what a mule is, a mule is a cross between a donkey and a horse, known for their huge ears. And this is where we get the name mule deer from. Not that they're related to mules in any, well, they're not mules, but uh, they have these big ears. That's where the name comes from. Other clues, white through the face. And antlers that are much taller than in white tails. They're a lot more vertical. Um, they actually come off in a series of Y shapes or branches branching from one to two. So those are some clues. This would be a group of females, mule deer does. Notice the huge ears in comparison to the white tail. Notice the white face. And very much like the bighorn sheep, they do have a white rump. So not a white underside of the tail like in the white-tailed deer, but a white entire rear end. All right, number 55. If you guessed caribou or reindeer, you would be correct. Uh, this animal interestingly has... Uh, as ranges that um, are, are North American, but also European. So this animal is, is found on our continent, but also over in Europe. And on North American soil, we call them a caribou. In the European areas, they call them reindeer. So uh, as we get closer here to uh, Christmas time, and we talk about you know Santa and his reindeer, and songs and cartoons and stuff like that, uh, might be interesting for you to know that when people talk about caribou, it's really the same animal, just a different area. Uh, one way to tell a caribou, if you look at their antlers, and these are almost, they almost seem uh, fictional how big they are, right? But if you look at the shape, they make a C shape. Okay, now, of course, it depends on which way he's facing, right? But you get it. There's a C shape, C for caribou. So that can help you. They also have sort of a lighter color between their head and their body. So their neck region tends to, tends to be lighter than the, the ends of their body. Here's another picture of some caribou. These are, uh, well, not these. This would be a female, the mom. And this would be two of the um, calves, babies. And 
Another picture of a caribou or reindeer feeding, and this gives us a sense of where these guys live. These live in the northern uh, part of the continent. We would call it the tundra. And so you can see the, the extent of plant growth in that area, very short grasses, um, you know, not a lot of trees. Next animal we have is the pronghorn antelope. Very unique animal. Uh, this is North America's fastest land mammal. Um, name is given, of course, to the horn here at the on their head and then the prong that faces forward. So this is the prong. This is where that name comes from. Uh, these animals are actually more of like a goat-like animal than a deer, but even there, they're a little bit different from goats. Uh, one slang term is, is speed goats, a play on the word speed boats because these animals are so fast. Um, kind of a, I don't know what you call that, a, a tan, a brown tan top with a, with a white underbelly. Um, you'll see then the next picture from the backside, they have a white rump and kind of a white neck in there. And we do have these in our state out in Western North Dakota. Sometimes you find them in other spots, but here would be uh, two female or younger pronghorn antelopes. This would probably be the view that a lot of people would see an antelope from because uh, they do have such good vision and uh, uh, speed. So running away from you could be a sight. Number 60, we have the moose. Uh, it's pretty easy to identify a moose if you see one. If you, if you, it's hard to mistake them for something else. They're, a, they're a big, uh, the biggest member of the deer family. They are very dark in color. And two other visual clues. One is the uh, tuft of fur and flesh here under the chin. I'm gonna throw the word out there. I think it's called a dewlap. Okay, you can uh, cross-reference that and see if I'm right. And scientists are still trying to figure that part of their body out, trying to figure out what it's all about. Um, the antlers of moose are very unique. Call them palmated, just like your hand. You know, if you were to just hold your hand out, you'd see that flat part called your palm, and then the finger is extending. So we would call it similarly in a moose. Here would be a female moose which is called a cow, a baby, a calf. And here they're drinking, okay? Um, and actually more so than drinking, they're actually uh, also eating. You can see the plant dripping there. Uh, but deer have a very uh, specific feeding behavior, a uh, very specific plant that they target. They may have that all to themselves. I'd have to do some more reading on that. Maybe that's something we will do. Number 62, here's a, a moose, and this is shedding the velvet. So if you uh, have completed the, the deer article from last week, the one on talking about male deer changes during the rut, you should have read a little bit about uh, velvet and what that all means. We, of course, will we'll learn more about that as we uh, get into skulls. 63, this is an elk. Um, elk, kind of like a caribou. The, the neck is opposite of a caribou. Remember, caribou had a lighter neck. Elk tend to have a darker neck and sort of a thicker or longer fur in that region. Their antlers, while similar to a caribou, remember caribou's curved forward like a C towards their nose, um, elk actually do the opposite. So this antler comes out of the head and it goes up and back. Okay. So if you can imagine it going up and sweeping backwards, that would be an elk. We do have some elk in North Dakota, um, typically thought of as a mountain animal, but they can live in, uh, in some other areas that aren't quite uh, technically mountains. Here we see a group of female elk. You can tell, uh, even though, 
These ones don't have antlers as a clue. We can still see that, uh, that darker neck area. I always think this is a funny picture. Here we have an elk doing what they call bugling and uh, white-tailed deer investigating. The best one is this guy. <laughs> Trying to figure out how that guy's making the noise. I have, I have no idea, but a little deer, kind of a cute little deer. Number 66. You got this one. I would be, I would be impressed if you, if you knew this one. Okay. Uh, this is called a fallow deer. This is actually a deer from, from Europe that was uh, brought over to some parts of the United States for, for hunting purposes. So there's areas in, in Texas and some of the Southern states where there are these pockets of these fallow deer, but it's kind of like a combination of a bunch of other stuff we've talked about today. Uh, we have the white spots that we see in, in some of the younger uh, fawns, like in white-tailed deer. And then we do have a sort of a C-shaped antler, yet it has some palmation in it. So, you know, you can see like elk features in this animal. It's got like moose features, caribou features. It's kind of like a, a bunch of stuff from all the other animals that we're more used to all thrown together in one. So, um, not native to the North American continent, but they are found in some spots and they've been you know, introduced by people. Number 67, one of the iconic animals of the American grasslands. If you're a, a college football fan, you've probably heard more about the bison than most Grand Forks residents care to hear about. But uh, yeah, this is an iconic animal, the bison. Sometimes we call them buffalo, but technically uh, there is a difference. Bison is what we want to call them. Remember, this animal used to be the native grazer to our prairies. And of course, um, over hunting and settling changed that. However, if we had bison herds like we had back in the, back in the day, our lives would not probably function the way we, we do you know, with highways and trains and all that stuff. Here's a baby bison. Kind of looks very similar to a domestic cow baby, a calf. Maybe a little stockier. Number 69, this is the musk ox. These live in the very northern part of Canada, the, the Arctic. Um, named because of the... Um, powerful odor that their body body emits, particularly, particularly the males. Um, but notice that thick coat they have, very well suited for living in the frigid temperatures of the tundra. Massive heads. These are some big animals. Big shaggy looking things. Number 70? 70? The feral horse. Feral means wild. And so you may have heard of the, the, the term feral. We'll use that throughout the, throughout the year here for various animals, but it just means wild. Um, horses are kind of a unique story without going into too much detail because we might, we might do something with it later. Um, there were native horses to the North American continent way before the last ice age. And uh, they died off. And, but they made it, they kept, they kept surviving in, in Europe and our current horses are of European descent. So they were brought back over by, by people, um, to the North American continent. So, uh, I've done some reading. If you found a horse skull, it would either have to be a very recent skull or really super old. Okay. There's kind of a period there where there was no horses on our, on our soil. Seventy one is the feral pig, which means wild pig. Um, these are much more common in the Southern States. Uh, you may have heard of people talk about hunting, hunting hogs or hunting pigs. Uh, luckily we don't have them that common up here in our state. They are detrimental to agriculture meaning that they will uproot plants and big herds of these pigs 
can really have a toll on cropland and and fields and so we don't we don't want them up here for that reason hunters would like to have them because i think uh well bacon right <laughs> ham pork chops taste good uh so whether that tastes the same as a store-bought pig or a farm-raised probably not but those southern states they do have some ample hunting opportunities for these guys once in a while you'll hear some feral pigs in north dakota uh, so they can well they say that this animal could be the next huge huge problem for overpopulation and damage so we'll see what happens you'll hear of it sometime in your life i'm sure they can look all different ways, very much like a regular pig. Uh, we'll get into some more pig stuff when we get to skulls. And the last one is the colored Picari. And uh, this one is also found in some of your extreme southern states. It's it's a it looks like a pig. It's uh, it's called, they consider it pig like. And this is kind of a bad picture. Um, it does have a lighter ring of hair around its neck, which is where the word collar comes from. Um, I picked this picture because showing some of the, uh, um, or one of the adaptations of this animal, they live in dry climates. And so to eat a, to eat a cactus seems like something you wouldn't want to do, but to get water, you would have to do it. So uh, kind of a neat feature of this animal that they've, you know, had the they have the ability to get water from places such as a cactus. All right, and that's it. Our next section is marine mammals. Uh, you will do some looking ahead, so uh, stay tuned for that, and we will see you guys later. Thanks for watching.